Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Eight million ways to die is over. We've all got our problems. Where is Sarah? You don't make the rules here today, baby. Jeff Bridges, star of Jagged Edge and Starman. You're going to blow the deal, man. Roseanne Arquette, star of Desperately Seeking Susan and Silverado. You got Sonny killed. They're in trouble. In love. For a a half-assed hooker, you're an extremely arrogant woman, you know that? And in way over their heads. It's murder, prostitution, drugs, and passion. Announcing the video cassette release of a sensational detective thriller. Now cut it loose! What? Hope we love you, baby. Anything can happen when there's eight million ways to die. Andy, I know there are I know there are a lot of things that you get as a letterboxed member, as a paying member of Letterboxd. I know that there are a lot of things that come up there, but um, that you don't get as a, just a general user. But can I tell you my favorite one? Please do. The big hero image on your profile that shows up on your personalized profile page 
that only shows up as a met. That's my favorite. Because right now, it's Harrison Ford in Blade Runner, and he's giving the test. <laughs> oh. And that picture right there shows... I mean, it just shows how cool I am, is what it does. Because I'm associated <laughs> now is? with Harrison Ford. I am one degree from Harrison Ford. He doesn't know this, but I know it. And that makes my heart warm. Is that how it works? You, is, <laughs> yeah. When you're when you're thinking about your experience with Letterbox.com, what is your uh, favorite feature that you get as a as a paying and supporting member of Letterboxd that you don't get as a as a general user? I mean, I think what you're talking about is one of the great benefits that you do get as a paying member is you get essentially your own stats page that has. Uh, it's personalized, right? It has kind of all the information that you want to kind of track about yourself, some of your favorite movies, um, lists that you're that, that you're doing. You can pin reviews to your profile. You can uh, duplicate lists. There's just so much stuff you can do in there. And yes, you've got, I, you know, it, it, I love how people also use it. Like some people like me, I put my, my favorite films up there and it just always has them showing. Some other people are like, these are the four most recent films that I've rated five stars, or these are my favorite films this month, or these are four films that really I've been thinking about a lot. And people really change that up to kind of create a kind of a, a persona about themselves on Letterboxd. And there's a lot you can get out of that for yourself and then also by going and looking at others' uh, pages. And so I think that I think those personalized pages are just a fantastic benefit that Letterboxd offers. <laughs> Picture, the picture on your profile is not as cool. Your, your favorite <laughs> film, of course, is Brazil. And I go to your member, your patron page, and it's Catherine Hellman getting her face stretched. That's such a great image. Come on. So good. <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> uh, this is why you like that Star Trek villain, too. I just realized that you really, it's about skin stretching, face skin Apparently stretching. Apparently it is. Apparently it is. You have, yeah. You're a real fetishist. Anyway, uh, if you guys want to join in uh, the fun, uh, Letterboxd is doing a great promotion for us. If you visit thenextreel.com slash Letterboxd, uh, you'll be taken over to your own upgrade page where you can uh, subscribe, get 20% off uh, for either the... Uh, uh, it, it's the the patron patrons the top of premiere or patron I think those are the two premiere and then patron and 20% off whether you're upgrading or if you're a new user so it, it's really great for because we know we have a lot of great letterbox uh, community members who have already paid uh, if you're within the window of upgrade uh, then you can go ahead and use the the, the same link uh, nextreel.com slash letterbox make sure you click on the upgrade link from there the 20% is already calculated into the uh, into the fee so um, support us support a great great service for movie lovers thenextreel.com slash letterboxed Andy, eight million ways to die. Can I just tell you a funny story? I was I was yes. on my Apple TV. I'm uh -huh. gonna, don't worry, I don't actually need you to agree. <laughs> you I'm don't going need to tell you the funny story. <laughs> oh, anyway. that was rhetorical. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I do the I, I have my Apple TV and I have the little Siri remote and I hit the little microphone and I say eight million ways to die. And usually when you say the title of the movie, it just pops right up and you can go watch it. And in this case, it said uh, the little text comes up on screen and it says. It sounds like you really need someone to talk to. Here's the nationwide suicide hotline, and it gives me the phone number. <laughs> oh, that's great. Isn't that great? I love, I, I actually, I do love that. I think that's a really great <laughs> feature. Wasn't what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and just so everybody knows, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, Eight million ways to die, uh, Andy. They're continuing our origin story of Oliver Stone in the 80s. This is, uh, you get the feeling this is a film that he wasn't uh, as crazy about, the the final product. He wasn't. Did you, were you able to channel Oliver Stone when you were watching the movie? How did it hit you? Uh, I actually kind of enjoyed it. I mean, I see it's it's definitely a problematic film in in that it feels a little disjointed throughout. You know, it, it never it never quite lands as far as what it's trying to do. 
but uh, the characters were really enjoyable. Like I really just got into kind of the, the, the way that this story was told and the, the kind of the journey that our hero, Matthew Scudder goes on as he's trying to find out what happened to this, uh, this prostitute, a friend of his. And uh, by the time we get to the end and Andy Garcia's, you know, crazy finale and everything, I, you know, and, and then kind of like these emotional beats with the alcoholism and AA and everything. I was like, you know, those, it was actually much different than I was expecting, but in the end I enjoyed it. Hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. I didn't. Um, uh, you know, I, I I'm coming to film. not be surprised anymore in this yeah. particular series with your reactions to these films. <laughs> I I feel like I'm on Team Stone, though. Like, hearing the way he talks about this in the original script and the movie as it was intended, uh, it, it I feel like I'm on the, the right side of history, at least. Uh, uh, hmm. Because I found it I found it a completely pedestrian yawn fest. Like, there was... I, I think it's, it's fine, the that there is this the the alcoholic stuff going in here the aa treatment i thought was was really nice and i liked that element of his character uh i liked the the way it worked i actually there were some things about um you know his relationship with rosanna arquette that i with bridges relationship with rosanna arquette i, I liked but in general as kind of a, a neo-noir i found it utterly forgettable i mean Almost, had I not been taking notes, I might have forgotten that I'd watched it minutes after I stopped playing it. Um, I, I found it really frustrating. Andy Garcia noted his first film appearance. Um, it is this. This feels very much like a like a student film, not an Oliver Stone film. Even at this point in Oliver Stone's career, early as it as it is, it it felt like the dialogue was weird and stilted. Like nobody really knew talks like that. I and. I hate L.A. Like I just the L.A. in the 80s vibe. I'm just I, I just it, it felt like a, a it felt like a bad Miami Vice knockoff, Andy. And that's saying something. I know you're a big fan of Miami Vice. Hmm. I, it's I, I, I feel like you're this may have been a bad time to do this particular series because it's really coming out that your hate of neon of everything 80s of the 80s music it's really it's only getting worse it's really been shining through yeah, yeah. <laughs> in this, yeah as we cover these films it's very clear that you're unhappy with the general look and everything and whereas I found it to be, and, and, and I, we can talk about the adaptation and moving the story from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast, that sort of thing. Um, but I feel in context of just the way that this story unfolds, I I found something interesting about the the kind of the glossiness and the the bright colors and that 80s vibe that for me, lent to the kind of that that interesting neo-noir grittiness that was kind of underneath it all. I think the thing that I struggle with the most is that there is no mystery to be figured out here. There's no other redeeming thing that I'm trying to solve as this police detective is trying to unravel this drug, this, you know, hidden drug cartel. Like, it was telegraphed so cleanly and perfectly what was going on throughout the movie that I felt like I had written it. And I hate that experience in movies. I hate when there are no surprises. And the pinnacle experience when we come to the final warehouse where Bridges is sitting there with all the the cocaine there and he's going to light it up. And it's just it's just grown men screaming at each other to cut her loose for like five straight minutes. I was real. I mean, forehead slappingly stunned that that sequence got made. It was just <laughs> bad. And I totally disagree just with you. Bad. I thought that was oh. I, I I thought there was actually real um, real threats being made, real tension in that standoff. Like I felt like like anybody could go off at any moment. Like I was really engaged with they were everything all going, going off. They were right. actively and, going off. And that's what they were right. just and so it, men screaming at each other. But that made it tense. And it, I believed that it was it would have been very easy for uh, Rosanna Arquette's character to get killed or for one of the other uh, thugs to pull his gun out and shoot. Like I, I, I felt kind of unsure as to what direction this film was going, knowing that it's a neo-noir and that, it's very likely that she could end up getting killed here or the Jeff Bridges character could end up getting killed. Like I actually felt like, okay, this is actually setting up a really tense, really interesting situation. I'm not sure what's going to, what's going to come of this. And I really enjoyed the way that that played out. 
I feel like it would have been redemptive for her to get killed in that sequence. It would have been something to act that would have surprised me. But I feel like I knew immediately how that was going to end up. I knew that Chance was going to get killed. I knew that, and I'm not saying that I'm just some sort of super sleuth, right? But I'm saying if you've seen enough movies, I feel like you get it. Like, you get where they're going with this. And the, and there were no... Uh, but the, the biggest sin of the movie is, I think, every single character was such a caricature that, uh, like, I just sort of um, ended up feeling like an overacted sketch of who they wanted to be. I didn't feel like there was anybody in here who was really naturally human. I, I like all of the tropes like she, she's a prostitute. Oh, good. So we're going to barge in on her when she's just finished with the trick and she's wearing a schoolgirl girl uniform like that's just so tropey. And I, I don't know. I don't know if it's because there have been movies since that continue those tropes. Uh, but I, I feel like it's just another data point in in the sort of emotionless tropiness of like we're going to we're going to show how gritty we are by showing a prostitute in a quilted in a, a you know uh quilted skirt you know what are those called kilt <laughs> I don't think it was a kilt <laughs> it's a kilt it's a little kilt yeah, yeah. Uh, I know not words <laughs> so, I like the idea of I, you know, her wearing a kilt though that's <laughs> Yeah, like, right. Well, you know, and, playing and the bagpipes the for, for, for her <laughs> customer. <laughs> the prostitute. I, I'd like something with a little Highlands flair. Can we do that? <laughs> no, I, I, I think the, 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 the challenge that I, you know, apart from not being surprised, at, it feels like he, he, the, the worldview that I carry is that this was a movie that was outside of Oliver Stone's vision. I read all of the getting it made stuff after I watched the movie, and those two things fit hand to glove. My experience of the movie and how hard it was to to make it and what Ashby did with it and and all of that. Uh, I think the highest uh, highlight in the movie is the train system leading to the front door. Man, I love that. <laughs> that was that was quite a unique little uh, thing. Yes. yes, I can't wait to talk more about these these yeah. peculiar little things. But yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a problematic film. It it it's not. Um, it it falls apart, I think. And I think there are some real issues with the structure, with uh, just the way it all comes together. It, I, it can't have been helpful having Hal Ashby directing this at this point in his life when he himself is going through serious alcohol addiction, serious cocaine addiction, and here he is making a film <laughs> about about a police officer trying to stop this big cocaine heist and there's coke everywhere in the movie and his lead character is an alcoholic who's going through aa i just i kept chuckling to myself about that like this is 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 he trying to find a way through his own problems by telling this story like what was the what was the the thrust that he had uh as far as his directorial choices with it i just thought it was very funny yeah but uh, but that being said, I mean, it was, uh, you know, I think a hard film to get made. And it's I mean, it's based on a novel. It's a it's a very popular character. Matthew Scudder is probably uh, Lawrence Block's most famous uh, character in his whole in his different crime stories that he's written. I think there's I don't know, maybe a, around 20 different novels that he's written of the character. Have you read any of them starting in the 70s? I haven't. Um, and I, I know there's only either. two film adaptations or maybe a few more. Um I think it's just two, actually. But yeah, so I think that there's a people who are fans of the novel weren't overly thrilled with the adaptation. My understanding is that Oliver Stone was hired to adapt the novel. And then Hal Ashby, very much in his kind of 70s way, wanted to kind of recraft it to really focus on the characters and give a lot of different elements to it, allowing his actors to improv and stuff like that. And then sounds like the studio came in and had R. Lance Hill come in to rewrite the script, who apparently really like inflated everything going on in it to the point where it was uh, it would have been a very difficult film to make for um, how he was doing it budget wise. Like he really just grew it to an incredible expanse and to the point where they had Robert Town come in to, un to do uncredited rewrites on the script 
after the fact. And Oliver Stone, meanwhile, he was too busy to be involved in it because he was off um, filming Salvador down in Mexico and so was unable to kind of help out at all. So that's why all these other people were doing all of this. And yeah, Oliver Stone didn't end up being very happy with the finished product. Hal Ashby was very upset that his producers took away any ability for him to do any rewrites. In fact, when they hired R. Lance Hill to come in and do the rewrites on the script, all of the rewrites went to the producers instead of Hal Ashby. They were the ones who had final approval. And then, of course, he got, he got um, you know, he, I don't know if he got let go or anything. He still got credited, um, even though he was so unhappy, he changed his name to a pseudonym, David Lee Henry. And Robert Towns' additions and fixes didn't get uh, him any credit. So it was just Oliver Stone and, and the, quote, David Lee Henry getting the uh, screenplay credits. But, you know, I don't think Hal Ashby was completely thrilled with how things ended up going with the uh, with the script. And I, I think that he very much at this end of his film career kind of felt like he was having to direct something that wasn't the story he was wanting to tell. And, and perhaps in a way he didn't want to tell it. And uh, also just not completely there. It, it just doesn't sound like he was really completely clicking with everything. But what I, I find about the film is that, I mean, we've talked about Hal Ashby several times in the show. We talked about being there. We talked about Harold and Maude. And Hal Ashby, I think, even in this particular state of mind, has, I think, a connection to character. And I find beats in these characters uh, that shine through and and tell me, you know, things that, okay, I can see Hal Ashby's touch. Like, I can see him connecting with this this struggle that Matt is having dealing with uh, his alcoholism his uh, you know leading to his family falling apart leading to him killing a man in front of his uh, his family on a on a drug bust like all these different things i can see ashby's personal connection and his connection with kind of the the humanity of his characters that lets those things come through and Sure, while while some of the other elements feel a little thin, I really enjoyed the way that uh, that Scudder's relationship uh, played out with um, with Chance. I thought that was actually a pretty interesting relationship that worked. And I just I thought Andy Garcia was fantastic as Angel. I thought he was a really interesting um, albeit maybe one of the more one sided characters, but I just I enjoyed the way that his character really had a, a dangerous edge that kind of kept um, coming through. I just, I found that really interesting. So I enjoyed these characters. Like, I really enjoyed being in this world with these characters. And I found the story, even when it was, you know, cut together in ways that didn't always work and the pacing was a little off, I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the world. I found what I see as one, one of those vaunted Hal Ashby moments you're talking about. And I didn't see anything else, but I'm going to tell you the one, and it is my favorite bit in the movie. And it is when they are taking the cork logs full of cocaine and they're loading the cars. This felt like it could have been right out of Harold and Maude. Like, I could have seen Harold and Maude doing this bit, where they load a hundred of these little cocaine logs into this car, and the as they come out, their hands fully burdened with more cocaine logs. He says, oh, no, we can't put them in there. You're not going to be able to see out the side mirrors. And that diminishes the act that they are doing, that they are actually taking the drugs so beautifully. I laughed out loud at that moment. It was so perfect uh, as they're as they're doing that. Here, we'll put them in put them in my car. Right? <laughs> they're loading the cocaine logs. I thought that was amazing. Uh, and the fact that they named uh, Tiny Lester uh, nose guard. I don't know what that's all about, but I thought it was fun. <laughs> so I don't know if that's from the book or what, but I thought it was great. <laughs> no scarred. Right. <laughs> uh, so um, you don't you didn't think that Hal Ashby's moments like when he is having his moments with the AA and everything like I, I felt like that Hal Ashby's humanity with the character was really shining through. You don't see no, that right. sort of thing in this sort of story. And I was like, that totally is what I get when I come to a Hal Ashby film is that sort of connection with the character. Yeah, I, it, I'll be at brief. Uh, I do. I, I do feel like that was right. And I like the end, the, the way it ends the movie with him on the beach, you know, talking about how he had, you know, he's 
he fell back into the bottle a few times and he's it's been a year, but he's still doing it. And he's still, you know, he's five weeks sober now. Like those those bits, I think, were um, well architected as someone who's, you know, not uh, as intimate with AA. It felt authentic to me. Um, and, and so I like that. I don't like that the the family stuff was unrequited, like they set up that, that it was so important about his, his relationship with his daughter. And we never see the daughter again. That She's, was I think, disappointing. One yeah. Shot. That was a huge disappointment for me. I felt like if you're going to if you're going to do this, we got to have some rebuilding um, of, uh, attempt to rebuild his life. Right. That's the that's a, a piece that I thought was was missing. And instead, uh, he's using his relationship with Roseanne Arquette's character to to as an avatar for his, you, you know, for the ways he's broken his family. And that's that's a strategy. It just didn't work for me. Um, and so I, I think overall, I, I just didn't it didn't feel like a, a Hal Ashby movie to me, as it as it sounds like it did to you. It, 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 it doesn't feel like an Oliver Stone movie. And I think to that credit, you know, he said the bottom line is my name should not be on that film. I'm embarrassed by it. It's really not me. I don't I, I feel like it's hard to even include it as as part of this series. Well, but that's a you know, I, I don't know. I think that that might just be him unhappy with the finished product. But it's it's a challenge when you're a writer and you're hired to adapt a novel and then you adapt it and it ends up getting changed. But still, a lot of the actual adaptation is what's on the screen. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's it's always that balance of, you know, who is like the screenwriter is going to get credit. But a lot of that still falls down on the shoulders of the author of the novel. Right. right. I mean, so right. it's just the nature of being an, a, a screenwriter who's adapting something. I, I Well, and what I've heard is that somebody uh, is that the reviews of this as a an adaptation are not good that it's it's, yeah, it's, it's not a, a little all over the place fiction. yeah yeah well yeah and i I'm, I'm curious to see what else is out there as far as what else Hal Ashby shot? Because, I mean, Hal Ashby, he had been an editor, which we also talked about right. uh, before he was directing and uh, always had that editor's eye and generally would shoot a lot of footage. He would do all these like improv types of, of filming and then take the, the footage and then craft it based on all the hours and hours of footage that he had shot. And in this particular case, you know, he had it taken away from him and didn't end up getting to edit this film. So it's entirely possible that that certain through lines that he had been in his head kind of setting up and planning for just were left by the wayside. Like maybe there is footage of a reun reunion with the daughter and the producers at this particular point didn't feel it was necessary to kind of complete that circle. And so that's where it ends up getting frustrating. And it's hard to, like, I, I don't know how much I should fault Hal Ashby, Oliver Stone, or who was involved, other than I know the producers did take it away from him. But I would be very curious to see what Hal Ashby's vision would have looked like had he been able to kind of stay on and finish the film. Yeah. And frankly, what Oliver Stone's original vision of this right. movie would have been. Yeah. Right. I, it, but but as much as we try to sort of protect their intentions, the movie we got isn't either of those movies. And the movie we got is is troublesome at best. Well, I'd say it's better than that. I, I think that it's actually a really interesting film. Like, I really like it. I thought it was actually an I feel like enjoyable... the more I don't like it, the more you yeah, like it. I'm just going to end up giving this five stars and a heart. It's, <laughs> it's the best neo noir ever made. No, I mean, yeah. it, it, it definitely has its issues, but... I, it just I, I found so much to like about just the the characters and everything, and so it's it's again it's far from perfect, but I don't think it's just a complete turd. I yeah, it's definitely in Turtsville for me. I I think the uh, um, I want that to be on the poster. This one's on its way to Turdsville for me. <laughs> it's on its way to <laughs> Turdsville. Um, I Jeff Bridges, uh, young looks great. Don't like the mustache. He sure does. That. Didn't didn't work for me, but if it's the character, it's uh, I, I guess I don't just. Oh, he always looks great in mustaches, though. It's it's a great Western element that he's obviously grown to like, because especially late put... in his career, like that, that is a yeah, regular. He's grown into Jeff that Bridges mustache staple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Um, so I, I get that he's he's fine. I I think it's he's um, fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's fine in this movie. I think, you know, you give these incredible performers, like, mediocre material, and sometimes even the people we trust the most to to deliver these stories on screen can't can't pull it off, right? Like, I, it's just, uh, I, I found it, you know, his his reads of some of the, uh, some of the dialogue, I, I just really had trouble with the dialogue. Like, I just not, I, I just didn't believe what was coming out of their mouths. Um, you know, from the weird way they used profanity. Okay, here's a great example. I, you know me, I'm, I love Brick. I really love the movie Brick. Yeah, that's a problem. I sure. know you yeah. don't. I know you don't. But one of the things that I like so much about it is that it wears its artifice of uh, the noir artifice so heavily on its sleeves and so out of context that it's like come all the way back around and become interesting to me uh, <laughs> because otherwise it's weird. And here it hasn't gotten all the way back around it. The way they use language is um is is strange it's uh like we're just gonna start throwing things at their mouths and see if we can make any of it stick and and sound normal and it never quite achieves it for me um and as such it is the uncanny valley of noir dialogue right Uh, i just am never able to quite get lost in the universe that they have have written uh because of the way they speak to one another that does happen from time to time largely it didn't bug me largely i thought it worked but i do think that there are times where it was a real problem and um i think an interesting way to kind of uh, lead into this is I think starting off with saying at the very beginning of this film, we have what is, I guess you could say, construed to be kind of that noirish, you know, um, uh, the naked city dialogue as he's talking about there's 8 million people in the naked city, you know, and he has that yeah. that whole thing that you you get a sense of that. Um, well, he's he's obviously talking when he's in his cruiser on his way to this this scene. Initially, I thought he was a helicopter, like a police helicopter guy, because, you know, it seems to be established the way that the yeah. helicopter is flying. But eventually the helicopter flying finds the cruiser and we are we come to find out that he's actually the one in the cruiser and he's talking to his partner. But the noirish dialogue in that particular moment that opens this film feels incredibly clunky clunky it all ties into this title eight million ways to die and it just it doesn't i don't know it it falls flat the way that the dialogue hits like that whole opening monologue that he has as a kind of narration over that opening shot which i really liked the opening shot especially the way that it kind of starts going almost inverted kind of really kind of throwing this weird sense to it i i enjoyed quite a bit but the dialogue in that scene is just like I could tell they were trying to get this neo noirish sort of feel, but that right out of the gate doesn't help when it's a little clunky like that, and it just feels not authentic. So then let's go to the very very end, the final climactic scene, right? The the final standoff on the train tracks, I guess. It's called a funicular. The, the train track thing? Yeah, it's called a funicular. What is that referring to? That's a new word to me. I'm very excited about this. I know. It's a transportation system. It has its cable cars that are, there's connecting points on a big incline, and it uses the the two cars that are counterbalanced. And so every time one's going up, another is coming down on the same cable, and the cables are looped over. There's a pulley at the top. Um, it was kind of a a thing. Or I, I don't I don't even know how many of them there are. I guess there's one that was brought up in La La Land uh, called Angel's Flight in L.A. that uh, since that movie has opened up again, it's kind of a, a another popular thing. But that's what those call those are called. They're called funiculars. That's amazing. Yeah, that's the most amazing thing I've learned today. And I, all I've wanted <laughs> since I watched this movie is an excuse to have one at my house. Like, could I put one to my bedroom, which is on the second floor? Like, you've got you're like, on a hill. Way Maybe could... you should talk to the city about you know getting one up to your uh, uh, up to the, your little cul-de-sac there. Just all the way from you're right, all the way from the main street down below. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty perfect. Uh, I don't want I don't want everybody riding my funicular. That's right. That could just be no. for your neighbors. Not just anyone rides this vernacular. That should have been the tagline on the movie. So, okay, back to my my question. There is, he has his, um, I don't want to talk about that, the standoff yet. His final speech on the beach, did you find that 
earned over the course of the film? Like, was there enough of the experience of him as an alcoholic and the intervention and enough data points in the movie to earn his final uh his final speech yeah i really enjoyed the that kind of that speech both speeches that he gives the first time early in the film when he first starts at a or we first see him he's been in six months now and uh, this is after his initial accident that he had on in the crime scene but then uh at the end of the beach i felt was a good counterpoint to that original one and he talks about you know i've failed a few times i you know but i've been getting back on i'm five weeks clean now and i felt that there was an emotional weight that really carried for me in that particular scene i i thought that was actually a strong way to kind of build to a close there i i it, for me, I wish that there, again, was a way to kind of reconnect to maybe not necessarily his ex-wife, but at least his daughter. His daughter. Like, I would like to have seen his daughter, like he had invited his daughter to this to kind of hear him talking and how he's trying to find a way to heal and stuff like that. God, you know what? You're right. Even a cutaway to his daughter being there yeah. would have been something. Right. It would have yeah, been something. That would have That would have helped. And, you know, that he has a fantastic line that I'm about to butcher because I didn't write it down. But it's this line about um, how he he just don't, he hopes that one day she knows um, just how important he is or she is in his life. Yeah. Um, and that that line hit me in the gut like it was just beautiful. And in hindsight, I wish that had been at the on the beach at the end. It came too early for me in terms of that alcoholic anonymous narrative um i, I think it could have i don't know for me stronger. i mean it, it, it was clear that this was a real struggle for him and that's what i i yeah. loved about him as this character like every time there was a you know he was talking to somebody he would always be joking it's like you know i'd be better if i could have a drink you know he'd always have that kind of joke uh, you know like he couldn't let it go and he always felt like he was getting tempted and it was a real struggle like i really bought his struggle every time it was it was on and i was just like i thought jeff bridges really nailed that and I know he had he was an actor who was also going through his own issues with with, mm -hmm. you know, alcoholism and drugs and stuff like that. And so I think I think that really comes through. And like when he wakes up after finding Sonny. after finding Sonny dead on the beach and he wakes up in an institution where he had been checked into because he had gotten himself so drunk and just he was a mess. His his body was like falling apart. Like I really bought that element of Jeff Bridges, like throughout the film, I thought he was the the piece that really carried everything for me. You know, I think that is that is the the movie I think I'd rather have seen. Yeah, um, is the is Hal Ashby directing the Jeff Bridges recovery story? <laughs> <laughs> what was that Robin Williams one where uh, like Robin Williams, Michael Key? There were a bunch of actors who did these like yeah. recovering alcoholic movies in the late eighties, early nineties. That's funny. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, Rosanna Arquette. Let's let's talk about, I guess, in context, the story. This is one of those stories in the '80s where it seems like, okay, let's let's bring in the high class prostitutes, and we're going to have this whole story element. You know, a, a hooker gets killed. Does anybody really care? Uh, he does, and so he's going to try to figure it out. And so, it it, it seemed like a trope in and of itself, like that whole idea of you know, helping somebody who no one really cares about. I feel like I've seen it in films a lot, especially from this period. And so it didn't really excite me too much that that's what the story was going to be about. But I ended up finding it kind of interesting. I thought, uh, first off, let me just say, leading into um, Rosanna Arquette, that um, Alexandra Paul is like the last person I would expect to see playing a prostitute because again, and I've said this, I, I don't remember which episode, but we had another episode where we brought her up in my head. Oh, it was Christine. She popped up in Christine when we talked about that, but she's That's always right. the virgin Connie Swale from Dragnet, which is like the farthest place that she could ever get from, uh, from being this particular character. And so it was really funny, especially she has a, a fairly, uh, uh, you know, a bold scene early in the film when she's when she goes into his place and is naked and she has a line that 
really shouldn't be a laugh line. It was one of the worst lines in the whole script. And I was laughing out loud so at stupid. how bad it was. And I can't even say it because it's just so inappropriate. But Because it's both wildly inappropriate and stupid. Like, I wouldn't yeah. even want to beep it if it were a good line, but it's so stupid that I don't want it in the world. <laughs> But that, that's what's so funny about it, like, because it's just, yeah. it's such a bad line. And I just like, oh, poor Alexandra had to had to find a way to say that line seriously. That was pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but I enjoyed her enough as a character. And I don't fully, I, I see that she was desperate and had a need to get out of this mess that she had found herself in. And so uh, reached out to Scudder. And, and that's where Rosanna comes in, because her character, Sarah, is... A much more interesting character because she is she is kind of this one who really wants nothing to do with Scudder. And I liked the way that that relationship played throughout the film. And Rosanna Arquette, I, I forget. I mean, she's never been like a favorite of mine or anything, but I do always find her to be an interesting performer. And there's something about her that is is captivating. And in this particular role, you know, somewhat early in her, in her career, I mean, it was... Uh, she had already done Desperately Seeking Susan and um, Silverado and After Hours and a number of other films before this one. So it's not like she was an unknown, but, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it, she could have, uh, there there could have been more with the character, but still, I didn't have that many issues with her. I actually, I, I did not have that many issues with her either, apart from how poorly the character was written. Like, it just, in, in terms of the things that already give me trouble, uh, I I generally like Rosanna Arquette. Yeah. And um, she's, she's an interesting actor with an interesting face and an interesting way of speaking. And, you know, I'm a big fan of The Big Blue, which came out a couple of years later. And so, um, like, this this is the sweet spot of the the years that I know of Rosanna Arquette's work, right? The, the 80s. And, um, and, and then I don't feel like I... I don't like, feel like I've seen a lot of her since then. Do you know? Like, I, I don't know that I could tell you I could name a movie of Rosanna Arquette's in the 90s. Well, uh, other than Pulp Fiction. I mean, that's... Oh, like, right, of course. I, I remember Fiction. that she popped up in Pulp Fiction, but she also right. was one of those people who kind of seemed to have a big time in the 80s. And she's been working consistently a lot. all of this time. Yeah. It's just, yeah, just not in stuff that... I'm as familiar with. But I mean, I certainly saw things that she did in the 90s. Fly to the Intruder, the Linguini Incident, uh, Nowhere to Run, Crash, Gone Fishing, uh, Buffalo 66, uh, Hope Floats, you know. So, I mean, she's she did quite a lot of stuff. She's always been a very busy, a busy performer. And um, it's just, yeah, it's, she's definitely taken a different path. She's not in, in the stuff that I'm watching quite as much. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> that's it crash you're right i should have i should have said crash yeah well maybe when we finish our uh or continue our david cronenberg series we can talk more about her yeah uh okay so rosanna arquette she's she was a, a higher point in, in the movie uh alexander paul I, I think that just to finish up your point on alexander paul i totally agree with you i it was a shock to see her here mostly because i just think she was miscast in this movie i think she's she it it's hard for me to believe the the kind of drug induced dits that she was trying to pull off here and i didn't believe i i have no idea even now how they they intended to rationalize her reaching out to scudder in the first place right like why did the person in the aa meeting run out and give him that envelope with money in it that says, I want to meet you. And it was her. I, I never made sense of that. Yeah, I mean, at first I thought he was getting served, right? It seemed like, mm -hmm. you know, the way that you see so often portrayed in films, like somebody coming up to you and oh, I've got you, I've got something for you and you've been served. And that's, it, that totally yep. seemed like what was going on in that moment. And then to have it be, you know, yeah, this invite to meet up with her in this place that also seemed like if you're going to be meeting with him, maybe don't invite him over to, you know, this place where, you know, he's going to be seeing everybody you work with, including the person you're trying to get away from. That seemed a little 
uh, far fetched to Strange. me. Yeah, yeah, a, a little far fetched. Uh, otherwise known as nonsensical. Like it just, it was a terrible way to bring us into the story. It felt ham handed. Like I, I don't know how else to get him in this room. Let's do this weird letter thing. Yeah, and it was, it was, it was peculiar because I really, and I, I mean, you bring up a really valid point. It's like, how does she ever come in contact with him anyway? And and I feel like yeah. that was something we really needed to know. Because initially, I'm like, did she find him through through chance? Because chance knew him. Chance had been a former um, prisoner who had it seemed uh, the way that it seemed he had been captured by Scudder, by Scudder. and, and yeah. put away. And now he's out and he's, quote, trying to make a name for himself doing other stuff, but basically seems to be a pimp who also runs grocery stores. Don't call him a pimp, Andy. That's right. Don't call him a pimp. He's a grocer. <laughs> so it was a it was an odd, and then she wants to get away, and you think it's from him, but then you find out she's actually trying to get away from Andy Garcia's character Angel because uh, he, he had basically used her to find out who was working at the grocery store, so he could basically get them on the take to help him smuggle in his cocaine, and that seemed to be kind of the basic structure of the story, and all of that seems pretty flimsy as far as the structure of it and how uh how she ended up getting involved and again going back to the whole thing how she ended up finding scudder in the first place all of that seems really yeah. uh frustrating and difficult to really uh, piece together so that's that's an element where the story is just it's very problematic and i i would hope that the original novel would definitely make more sense of that yeah Th- that's one of the things that that i really struggle with and i mentioned earlier that there was no mystery to figure out in this neo noir mystery <laughs> there's no mystery it's just the story unveiling and the way it's presented when he says she wasn't sunny wasn't trying to get away from you she was trying to get away from angel the whole time we didn't know there was a mystery to be figured out like it was presented as if that was a grand reveal, but it wasn't a grand reveal because at the point, I didn't know I was supposed to care about it. <laughs> like, I I didn't know I was supposed to wonder what her motivation was. I really thought she was just trying to get out of the life. And yeah, right, right. I, I think the, the movie felt like the movie wanted me to feel more strongly about this particular angle than I ever did uh, and until it said, bum, bum, bum. And I was, I mean, it was a sad trombone for me in my head. So, okay, so that's her. Uh, how about uh, the uh, good and kind uh, Randy Brooks as Chance? You like you like where he fit? I do. And actually, I thought that was a really interesting character. Having a character like this who had that angle. You know, he they had this real contentious relationship because he had been arrested by uh, Scudder in the past, and now he was trying to do something else. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I didn't, I, I, I kind of struggled with the whole idea of like this, uh, granted, Scudder at this particular point that we're following him is no longer a police officer. So it's not like he can bust him if he's, if he is working as a pimp. But I, I thought it was an interesting relationship that was created. And so I actually enjoyed that. And I thought it was interesting how it kind of evolved and they became, to a certain extent, kind of partners. I thought that was kind of, kind of an interesting partners, twist. if not buddies. Yes, right. Th- this was a buddy experience near the end when they're in the car and they got the camera in the back seat and they're run the run the light man run the stop sign and they're having their little banter. <laughs> this was straight up uh, veered into Buddiesville. Out, out of just north of Turdsville. He had been in Reservoir Dogs, and I don't remember yeah. him in Reservoir Dogs. I don't either. As Holdaway. I saw that, I, I, I didn't remember him at all in that. It, but looking at the rest of his credits, I mean, he's done a lot of TV. He's done a lot. He has been, I am sure I have seen him because I watched a lot of Scarecrow and Mrs. King yeah. and Simon and Simon and L.A. Law and Hunter. And these were the things that, uh, you know, he was an episodic uh, character actor, and I'm sure I've seen him in a lot of stuff. I wouldn't have been able to tell you that. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I, it, he's not an actor who I'd been uh, that particular. I, I didn't take note of him, I should say. Um, yeah. But I enjoyed him in the role here. I, I bought him. I thought he worked well. The last person we have to talk about, because I've already told you how I feel about it a, a little bit, is Andy Garcia as Angel Maldonado. Can I just say, I watch this with the with the uh, subtitles on because uh, occasionally my family gets loud in other rooms and I want to make sure I don't miss anything. And it really upset me that every time 
Angel speaks to Scudder. He calls him Scooter. Right. And they did not properly write that in the captions. I wanted it to be re- written as <laughs> S-C-O-O-T-E-R every time. <laughs> And I want to see in the original screenplay, what was it intended to be? Is it just an affectation of the accent that they really wanted this to be? Or was he really he was he really trying to insult Scudder by calling him Scooter? Because that's too good. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty funny. I he had to be totally trying to poke at him. I, I thought it was pretty funny. That just it feels like a thing that that, that it, it's too obvious. It's not just a trick of my ear. It had to be. No, it absolutely had to be him poking at him, like finding a way to yeah. get under his skin always. You know, it's. Yeah. I mean, come on. We see this a lot. It happens right now in politics. People say other people's names wrong intentionally just yeah. to get under their skin, just to say, I don't have enough respect for you to even bother trying to say your name correctly. Right. Yeah, it's it's very much a thing. OK, so w- you are on Team Garcia. I thought he was great. I enjoyed that he had a lot of chances to do little things to give his character a, a constantly interesting edge, right? Like we see him just the way that like one of the first times that he's talking to Chance and they're talking or something, he does something like he sticks his tongue out really far. He does some crazy thing. And then later, just like when he's talking to um, when he's talking to Sarah and he's just getting so frustrated because he know because he now knows that there's something involving her and he's going to have to, you know, kind of do this whole thing at the end with her taped to the gun and all that sort of stuff. And the way that he's like taking it out and just like he's like shaking his arms and just like he constantly was like he had a lot of excess energy and anger and stuff that he was getting out in weird like arm movements or just facial things and stuff like that and almost like snarls and stuff. And then by the time you get to the end and you've got that that shootout, which I thought was great on the funicular, and you've got that uh, that final death and he's like looking through the the uh, the train tracks down at at Scudder, who's down on the the um, I don't know the the I don't know what those beams, all the different beams underneath it. I think they're called the funicularum. <laughs> the funicularum. And, um, and, and Scudder shoots him and stuff. And he's got like the lights on his eyes. It's just that intense look on Andy Garcia's yeah. eyes. And I'm like, that is the second best set of villains' eyes I've seen since Christopher Plummer's in The Silent Partner when he looks through the mail slot in that movie mm-hmm. and just those intense killer eyes. I just, uh, uh, Andy Garcia's eyes were just like right up there for uh, killer eyes for me. I agree with you. And I think he brings that sweet, sweet Andy Garcia energy to this to this part um, that that feels a a little bit like coming home. Right. I mean, it's it is familiar. Um, I I think where the performance suffers is in the the script. And again, in some of those areas of dialogue that feel so stilted and and just wrong to me, what this made me want to do more than anything else is more Andy Garcia movies, because I think there is uh, there's so much to this guy. And it was fascinating to watch this equivalent experience of going back and watching, you know, a, a student film from somebody who's now incredibly famous. Right. I I, I um, felt a little bit about that, uh, like that watching going back and watching the following uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, or one of Christopher Nolan's early films. Like I had that experience of like feeling really good about seeing where they came from. And that is in large part the intention of the Oliver Stone series about seeing where they came from. And for Andy Garcia. I can plot a point here at his at the performative aspects of his uh, of his career right here in Eight Million Ways to Die and and paint that trajectory to what I like so much about him in, um, you know, some of his other sort of diabolical comic roles like in Oceans. Uh, You know, I mean, he's just I really like the way he uses that energy. I just think it was it was clumsy here for many reasons that I'll say are out of his control. Interesting. Okay. But I'm, I totally agree with you in the, the final chase upon the funicula, <laughs> which is all of the, you know, pieces related to the funicular and the funiculorum. Um, <laughs> as Latin, yeah, probably not a lot of people know that. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I really think that chase was actually pretty darn good. I liked it. It was a little bit weird because it feels like some of the angles they used, like it, it is really a transport to get to somebody's front door. And it's not that long. And it felt a little bit like a toy set. But once they once uh, 
Scudder climbed down underneath, and we got to have that difference in um, in in you know structure mm-hmm. for blocking the scene. I think it became much more interesting. And you're absolutely right. The very end and the, the way they linger uh, on him reloading his gun, I think, was actually quite good. Yeah, yeah, it was thrilling. So high point. Yeah, and I think he's great. So this is interesting. Just to, going back to the original novel. Apparently, this character is one that Stone added to the story because the way that the original story was structured is that we only really confront the bad guy the one time at the very end. And so what happened is uh, here, I'll just let me just read this this passage. The movie rights were optioned quite early on, though original screenwriter Oliver Stone always intended to expand the book to strengthen the story and give Matt a stronger antagonist. In the book, he only meets the killer once, right at the end. This ultimately led to the creation of a brand new villain, Angel Maldonado. And so that's why Angel came into play here in the particular story. And so it makes me wonder if the original way that the story had uh, played out would have worked or if by having Andy Garcia in as this, you know, kind of an interesting kind of kooky character that just has an edge of danger throughout. And even if you're not really sure if he's really doing it or what he's doing or what the main st- you know crux of the story is, I don't know. I, I think it actually ends up helping. And again, I haven't read the novel to compare, but just at least I like that he's a character who is threaded throughout. Yeah, I, I think that was a smarter uh, a smarter choice, and I think something that they can get away with in the book uh, that they they couldn't have gotten away with. It, we, I think we would have walked away with the same feeling of of the the missing daughter that we do have with the with the movie. That there is this this character out there who we haven't met yet. It is an incredibly artful script that allows you to meet that character at the end and have it feel earned and yeah. rewarded. Uh, I I think we would have really missed that. And Andy Garcia does a, a fine job bringing that character in and out of the story as he does. I think it's I think it's good. Yeah. OK, so that's the those are the principles. Anybody else that you feel like really landed? I'm, I'm glad we walked through this, though, the character by character. I think that that helps me get a sense of of where some of the things break down for me that don't for you. But is there anybody else that you feel like is missing? I mean, that's largely it, you know, and I, I think that with these characters, the the story generally is held together with what they're providing. All right. All right. So uh, how about camera? In context of that neo-noir, I think that this captures the that kind of 80s sheen well, in a way that ends up fitting for kind of the way that the story, um, the story's gritty elements work. And it, but it never stood out. And I guess that's if there's anything that that may frustrate me, other than maybe a few moments like I thought that the again, going back to that final shootout on the funicular uh, was pretty interesting. But otherwise, nothing stood out as an emphasis in color, an emphasis in that 80s. L.A. sheen that was a counterpoint to this CD underbelly. Yeah, I I think it was I think it was weirdly I don't know weirdly kind of boring. You know, like I I felt like there was so much other stuff going on in this movie. There are just these long, lingering two shots that um, you know that. I feel like there's just no texture to them, no sense of like editorial pace, which really surprised me because of Ashby and Ashby being who he is, um, that that it felt like there was no sense of 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 texture to the to the film as a whole um, visually. And I that frustrated me. I, you know, I mean, it, it has its moments. I do think moments shine through. And I mean, knowing who the DP is, this is uh, Stephen H. Burham, who shot the film. I mean, he's got an incredible filmography, especially uh, in this time working a lot with uh, Brian De Palma, uh, Francis Ford Coppola on stuff like, you know, The Outsiders, Rumblefish, uh, Body Double, St. Elmo's Fire. Uh, after this, he would do The Untouchables, Casualties of War. Yeah. Raising Cain, not a great film necessarily, but again, Brian De Palma, Carlito's Way, uh, Mission Impossible, The Shadow, uh, talking about uh, from our John Lone who knows? last week. Yeah, who knows? So I, I think there's, he's a, a DP who definitely 
knows what he's doing. And in context of the shady criminal side of life can craft a lot of uh, kind of creative shots that work. I just I, I felt like I caught them periodically here. I actually really liked the scene when when Sonny comes up to Matt's place. Like I thought that was actually lit really nicely, despite some of the clunky dialogue that we were um, we had to live with. But mm-hmm. I, I thought it looked beautiful. And actually, I also say the bars generally when he was going in and out of the bars, those also that that captured a lot of that seedy underbelly. So again, it's it's kind of hit and miss. But I do think that I think it's there. It's just not consistent. That's, I think, how I generally felt about it. That's fair. Uh, James Newton Howard. He was actually married to Roseanne Arquette at the time that he did this. So, oh, Hollywood. So I don't know if you, that's... You why, and your coupling. <laughs> I don't know if that's why he ended up on the job, but of course he is one of the one of my 10 J's, uh, another of the great film composers. And, you know, I just, I love his stuff. It's just always so nice to to hear his uh, his music. And, you know, as I was watching this, uh, and this is early in his career, this is like, you know, one of his first few movie credits. I couldn't help but think that... Uh, as it was playing, I'm like, oh, Pete's going to hate this. There's a lot of those 80s synth in here. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of it. Yeah. So much 80s synth. But I loved it. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Again, and I, I think that what is what has come to me and I, I know I am. I, I know I'm kind of in the middle ground. There are people, you know, as you kind of read people who think about this movie and really, really don't like it. Right. And I, they're kind of like with me and there. And but I also recognize that th- a lot of the things that I don't like about this movie are not things that actually make it a bad movie. I think script problems make it a bad movie. Uh, I think that the music is an issue of taste and I don't have that taste right now. Taste is a spectrum. Who knows? In the year 2030, I may come back to 80 synth and just that's all I want to listen to, Andy. I may get <laughs> James Newton Howard wrote 8 Million Ways to Die score as a tattoo. Uh, you never know how I'm going to feel about it. But this is, uh, I, I didn't give it a whole lot of extra thought. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I really think that it works in context of kind of the neo-noir uh, sounds that they were trying to create. But, uh, you know, I can yeah. appreciate it. It is of the era. And there are times when that, uh, you know, works for people and there are times when it doesn't. So I totally appreciate that. I understand it. So sequels and remakes. I I have to tell you, co- controversial opinion, maybe, given that I already have a controversial opinion on this movie. It is surprising to me that we haven't seen a whole lot more Matthew Scudder have you did like you say movies, you read some adaptations? I could no, no, I haven't. But just based on Bridges' performance of this sort of down and out cop, he's got all the right kind of challenges against him. He's got a estranged family. He's trying to rebuild after being an alcoholic. I could actually see this being a hell of a series. Why have we not seen more of these? And it really, actually, when I read what the one was, the other one that's a Matthew Scudder. It really surprised me that I did not connect it as a Matthew Scudder. Which I haven't seen. The other one that you're talking about is the uh, is the 2014 film with Liam Neeson, A Walk Among the Tombstones, that Scott Frank directed. I I missed that. I remember it coming out. I remember it getting, you know, pretty decent reviews. But um, it's just one that somehow got past me. I never got around to it. I, I feel like Liam Neeson hit this point in his career where I felt like he was having a movie like this come out like every year. And so I I, I feel like I just yeah. kind of started skipping most of his output. Um, and maybe that was uh, a mistake. So now, but now I'm really curious, just like you, I'm very curious what is going on with uh, the character of Matthew Scudder. Because like I said, there's probably about uh, about 20-ish novels or so, uh, starting in 1976 with The Sins of Our Fathers, up through at least 2019 with A Time to Scatter Stones. So that's it, though. Those are the wow. only two. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I am curious what is going on with this. I don't know. But I will say the author, Lawrence Block, when... Uh, when A Walk Among the Tombstones came out, he did say that Liam Neeson is the guy that he has always had in his head ever since he saw Michael Collins in the, uh, I can't remember, early 90s. Uh, he said, that's the guy, that is that is my mental representation of the character of Matthew Scudder. And he was thrilled with the casting, and I guess he really enjoyed that translation of that particular film 
perhaps if it had done better, maybe there would be more. I think that that begs the question, right? How did it actually end up doing, you know, for real, not just on this podcast? Uh, Any awards of note? This one wasn't a big award winner. It only had one nomination at all. And that was at the New York Film Critics Circle Awards. They did nominate Andy Garcia, Best Supporting Actor, but he lost to Daniel Day-Lewis for My Beautiful Laundrette and A Room With a View. I, you know, I always question these awards where it's like, (laughs) you know, it's one actor in one role who has to battle somebody who has several films Two, that he's... Yeah, several roles. Yeah, that's like, nonsense. That's a lot of Daniel Day-Lewis to go up against. Yeah. And that's a hard person to go up against <laughs> even with one that's film. a whole lot of Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> I would have given him... I, I would have actually given it to him for either film. Why do they feel the need to bundle? Oh, uh, well. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about at the box office? Well, Ashby did have $18 million to play with for his last feature film. That's a pretty good-sized budget for this uh, this point in time for a director who is uh, kind of on the outs because of everything going on in his life. So, but it's a pretty good budget. That is about $42.1 million in today's dollars. As we discussed last week, this movie did open April 23rd, 1986, opposite Oliver Stone's Salvador, along with Violets Are Blue. And just like Salvador, Ashby's movie couldn't find its audience either. This one ended up only grossing 1.3 million or 3 million in today's dollars. That lands this one with an adjusted loss per finish minute of $340,000. Sadly, Ashby, uh, this was his last feature film. Uh, he was kind of, it didn't really, you know, have much of a standing after this. Uh, he did a few more TV projects and then he died in 1988. No. Sad. A rough way to go. Yeah. Uh, but. At least it, you know, makes for a fun podcast. Let's take it to the mat. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. You'll see all the movies we've talked about on this very show. If you swipe over in your show notes and tap on the word flick chart, it'll take you to 8 million ways to die where you can add it to your own list and see how it stands up against ours. All right. First up, we have 8 million ways to die or in darkness. In darkness. I'll say in darkness. Eight million ways to die or shivers. Shivers. I'm going to say eight million ways to die. All right. All right. One. All right. One, two, two, three. three. Rock. Paper. Oh, shivers takes it. Mm-hmm. Eight million ways to die or Labor Day. Labor Day. I'll say eight million ways to die. Oh, Andy, this is going to be one for the ages. <laughs> Here we go. One, one two, two, three. three. Rock. Scissors. Oh, Labor Day takes it. Eight million ways to die or next Friday. Let's say eight million ways to die. <sighs> I'll give it to you. I'll give this one. This I'll is the this Tony to Tiny Lester double whammy we've yeah, got going is. on here. It is. I liked uh, Nose Guard better. He was so poorly used in next Friday. Yeah. <sighs> he was really poorly used in this one. Uh, he got his moment. Actually, he didn't. He should have he really been able didn't. to yeah, fight some more. But 8 Million Ways to Die, you're, you're taking that one, right? Yeah, I'll let you have it. 8 Million Ways to Die or Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Battle for the Planet of the Apes. 8 Million Ways to Die or The Hound of the Baskervilles. So many dogs. There are, yeah, there's one dog, right? I know. It's just, just the hound. Me. That was really the problem. <laughs> the dog in the trap door. All right. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I, I i'll probably hound of the baskervilles at this point i don't i mean i've lost i'm gonna say eight million ways to die okay you can have it all right i'll take it hey i gotta take it when i can get it eight million ways to die are in the heart of the sea oh jeez. oh in the heart of the eight sea. million ways eight million ways in to die. the heart of the sea just that right. whale alone all right the Come whale on. certainly but i yeah. yeah it's but at least i wasn't sleeping through this movie so here we go <laughs> One, one, two, two, three, three, rock. scissors. All right. Eight million ways to die takes it. Eight million ways to die or Rocky Five. Got some street fighting going on. Yeah, Rocky Five. I mean, in terms of movies with weirdly written dialogue, I'll take Rocky any day. I'm going to take the neo noir. I'm going to go with eight million ways to die. All right. One, one, two, two, three, three, rock. paper. Eight million ways to die takes it. Eight million ways to die or battle for the planet of the apes again. We already did that yep. one. So 
That puts 8 Million Ways to Die in spot 451 on our chart. 451 out of 495, it's only a 9 percent. Pretty low. Pretty low on our chart. Pretty low, Andy, but lower still for me. <laughs> How'd it do for you? I think that here's here's my impression of your issue with these Oliver Stone but uh, would you do it, in our series. No, no, no. no, no would listen, you actually listen. do it as an impression of me? Give your impression no, no, no. of me doing an impression of me. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Here's here's the problem that you have is you're watching these like first thing in the morning in the sunny day, your family's walking around. If you watch these at night in the dark, I have a feeling you're gonna these will end up working better for you. I have a feeling that you are totally deluded. A bad movie <laughs> is a bad movie, Andy. <laughs> How'd it do on your list? This one landed, you know, it did better. It still is full of problems, but it landed in spot 3153 out of 4566. That is a 31%. 31%. All right. So mine landed at 1443 out of 1489. That is a 3%. Uh, and if I'm going by the algorithm over at Flickchart, sending me over to letterbox.com slash the next reel, uh, this should be a zero star movie. I don't know. I think it probably would have been had we not talked about it, but I'm going to give you a couple of points on it. And so I will make it a, generously a one star, no heart movie. Oh, my. Um, so generous of you. I'm so generous, right? <laughs> so kind. This did better for me. I, you know, it is full of problems, but two and a half stars and a heart. It, this one, I was saying this was a this was a particularly flick charty, hate crimey kind of movie um, because. Like it just, it, there was just no rational way to have it win against anything that Flickchart put it up against. Anything, like until the mm. very end, right? It, it just was. It was just rough. It was rough. I yeah. I mean, it's a it. I I guess I enjoyed it more than you. This is a film I would actually watch again. Like I actually enjoyed these characters. I enjoyed Jeff Bridges a lot in this film. The crime story is it it's not as strong as it could be. The dialogue is clunky throughout, but I really liked the characters and I love the standoff at the end in the warehouse. I know you didn't, but I loved that. And I loved everything on the funicular at the end. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. I so I found the house where this is at. Where is it? It's in Malibu, 3469 Cross Creek Road in Malibu. Apparently, it is now... Oh, I, I have to talk about more locations. I'm sorry. I forgot this yeah. whole part of the conversation. But this place, it's been remodeled. The funicular is no longer there, sadly. <sighs> I was very disappointed to see that they have since remodeled and taken the funicular out. Broke my heart. That's terrible. I'm looking it up on maps right now. Yeah, so that's the first location that's that's worth talking about. The second location that's worth talking about is Andy Garcia's house. It is uh, on Rodeo Drive. It's 507 North Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. It is a house that is patterned after Gaudi, as he says. And if you look at it, it is like insane, not just from the street view on Google Maps, but also from the aerial view, like the roofs, the roofs and everything all are painted in funky ways. The whole place really looks like this. It is is a bonkers place that was designed to kind of have this this feel throughout and i really really like his house i thought that was just a crazy crazy place that they they talk about oh, quite a bit he's clearly proud of the fact that he he bought this gaudi house and everything i so that's the second cool location worth talking about right yes Last but not least, Pete, and this I thought was hilarious. There is a scene when Jeff Bridges is talking to, unfortunately, I can't remember which character, but he's talking to them out in front of the, at the time it was the, the uh, is it Nikken Company? N-I-K-K-E-N? Nikken. The magnet company. I can't believe you're bringing this up. The Nikken what? Company headquarters. Now it's the Massimo headquarters. Although I actually, it might not even be that anymore. But anyway, this is in Irvine, California, and it is the place with the, the, the plane, like the little model plane out in front. And this is the same place that years later, Jeff Bridges would be filming with, uh, Robert Downey Jr. in front of as Stark Industries headquarters for Iron Man. No. Yes. How funny is that? <laughs> that is amazing that it would go from Nikan to Massimo, and now Massimo's in jail for college defrauding, and it becomes the Stark headquarters. I couldn't happen to a nicer company. 
interesting location usage uh, that I I had to talk about. Had to make sure we squeeze that in here. I'm looking at the 3469 Cross Creek Road. I guess I can kind of see where it might have been the funicular. It's hard to tell because they've yeah. clearly like totally the whole property torn has stuff been down. Yeah. yeah, they've changed everything there. But it had that real steep incline going up to the kind of the castle-y looking house. So, but what what I note you didn't say is that the place right next door to it is this beautiful, lush, like palatial, bigger than the other one. It's this mm-hmm. palatial place, and the red. It's it's actually it it's clearly a home. It's clearly a home, but they have a registered business there. California spa covers and covers ends in a Z. <laughs> and if that doesn't belong in this very movie, I don't know what does. There you Something go. more funny. Z's for plurals. All right. Uh, so that's where we are. It's um, it's uh, I'm glad we're done. What do we do? What are we doing next? <laughs> Well, I think we're getting into the stretch of Oliver Stone's films that, uh, you know, really, like we've gone through the beginning of his career. We've gone through the writing patch that he did for quite a while because he was he kind of, you know, didn't do well with his first uh, film out of the gate or his first film after a while when he did The Hand. He did Salvador. It was not received that well, but it was interesting. And the next one that he's going to be uh, able to do the same year, and this is where things really start taking a turn for him and his career. It is, of course, Platoon that's going to come out this same year in 1986, uh, later in the year. And uh, that's where Oliver Stone, the Oliver Stone, really uh, comes to fruition. So that's going to be an interesting one to look at and add to the series. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Letterbox giveth, Andrew. As Letterboxd always doeth. Now, I went super low, so I was supposed to go super high, but I didn't. I didn't go super high. And I would like to take the initiative to go first because I think it's context setting the review that I have. Do you mind? Please do. All right. Uh, I went in right down the middle. It's well, it's a little it's higher than the middle. Uh, it's a three and a half star review from the giant claw. He says, or they say. Here is a list of movies with the same score on Rotten Tomatoes as this movie. <laughs> Jaws the Revenge, Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2, The Garbage Pail Kids movie, Manos, The Hands of Fate, Fred the movie, and It's Pat. Here's a list of movies with better scores on Rotten Tomatoes than this movie. The Last Airbender. The Adventures of Pluto Nash, Caddyshack 2, The Apparition, Feet.com, Battlefield Earth, Disaster Movie, and Alone in the Dark. I'm dead serious. This movie holds a big fat goose egg on Rotten Tomatoes, which is the lowest I've ever seen for a barely talked about and surprisingly really good crime flick. From what I've heard, Eight Million Ways to Die is a butchering of the crime novel by Lawrence Brock. I've never read the novel, nor did I know this was based on any kind of work of, of fiction. So I'm going into this, as it usually is, judging it as a film. And what I got was Jeff Bridges being awesome, as usual, a great villain villain in the always fun to watch Andy Garcia and an exciting thrill ride of plot dealing with alcohol abuse, dead hookers, and shady business deals. It honestly stuns me how this has a zero on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm sorry, I'm harping on this, but The Last Airbender? I mean, admittedly, only seven people have reviewed it, but you'd think one dude would have at least something positive to say about this. Now, I'm sure people who've read the book loathe this film. I mean, this was the last appearance of Brock's Matt Scudder's char- Scudder character until the more critically liked A Walk Among the Tombstones almost 30 years later. But as someone going into this blind, it's the most 80s and cocaine-fueled ride I've had in a while. From the giant claw. Wow, that's great, right? Interesting. Yeah, uh, t- I, it makes me think maybe we should do the giant claws series of movies with the same score on Rotten Tomatoes. You'd like to? 
like to get its pat in the list, don't you think? I've been waiting. I've been trying to find the right series. Uh, why yeah. can we just skip Super Babies 1 and go straight to Baby Geniuses 2? Please. I don't even need that first garbage. I... Your your review is awfully long, so I have a, a I have several reviews I'd like to read. Oh, you're gonna okay. That's okay. All right, yeah. This is yeah, a quick you know, pro quo review thing. I exactly, get it. exactly. No, I get it. Yeah. All right, so my first one, I, I've got a, a variety of them, and I think I'll go from low to high because I want to end on a high note. Okay. First one, two stars by Jazz Brunch, who said they should have called this eight million ways to deliver the line "cut her loose" over and over. <laughs> 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 Nailed it. I thought Nailed you'd like it. that one. I thought oh, you'd like that Andy, one. Andy, that is, it could not be more perfect. Okay. The next two you could stars. By, there, but right. Yeah, going. I could have. The next two stars, Gary Joyce, who says, eight million reasons you shouldn't watch, eight million things wrong with this movie. Both would have been better and more titles there. There's probably eight million titles that are better too. Awful movie. Uh, the third <laughs> one I have is by Roy Robinson, who you know, a little liked it a little more, two and a half. The title is misleading. I counted like, 11 or 12 ways to die. <laughs> All I can keep thinking is I, I can't wait to hear the 8 million in once. <laughs> yeah, right. Last but not least, the snake emoji gave this five stars and said, effing hell yes. 8 million ways to die is like the fourth line of dialogue, and it's said within the first minute. A perfect <laughs> movie. <laughs> You know, that's a really good point. I, and I, I made the note. They use the title in the movie. Uh, yeah, yeah. It didn't, it, I didn't find it as offensive as some others, but um, yeah, it was not great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Letterboxd. It's hard to believe we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me... Producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchase is made through our links. Give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We covered a lot of great movies that were adapted from other material in Season 10. Our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals is where listeners can purchase the source material behind all our adapted film discussions. It helps support the show at no extra cost when you buy through our links. In our foreign language Best Picture nominees series, we looked at several adaptations, including Z, The Postman Il Postino, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Letters from Iwo Jima. We hit the high seas with In the Heart of the Sea from Nathaniel Philbrick's nonfiction book for our Aquatic Killers series. Eh, definitely a weaker entry in that series. I bet the book is better. Oh, me too. Member bonus episodes featured adaptations like Gone Girl, The Russia House, Ivanhoe, The Hot Rock, The Big Heat, and Naked Lunch. Oliver Stone brought not just original stories, but also adaptations like Conan the Barbarian, Scarface, Year of the Dragon, Eight Million Ways to Die, Talk Radio, and Born on the Fourth of July. Mary Heron's disturbingly insightful American Psycho was adapted from the Brett Easton Ellis book. You like Huey Lewis in the news? Oh my God, it even has a watermark. And of course, more Stephen King with The Mist, The Green Mile, and The Shawshank Redemption for our King a la Darabont series. Find links to all of these books and more adapted films on our Originals page. That's thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports our show. Get the full list of books that we've talked about and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals.